my privilege to be here this morning, and it is my great privilege to serve with Josh in Atlanta. And if you want to hear a great sermon, you go on last Sunday morning and hear that prayer that he just prayed. Uh, you can go on our website and hear that, and I am, I'm just so blessed to get to serve with them. My, uh, some of my family is here. It's a wonderful time to get to be here. Uh, my wife is with me. And uh, I think my wife is just going the Pepperdine route. I took her to Tulsa one year, and it had a freak blizzard, and we nearly never got home. And then we came to, uh, to, to Pepperdine, she loved it. So I'm getting a little more traction bringing her to Malibu than I am to Tulsa. And, uh, and then it was also a great joy this morning. I'm getting to teach a class, and this morning I got to hear our daughter Amy bring the Word of God. And it was astounding uh, to get to learn what God had laid on her heart so Oh, what a gift. Let's turn our Bibles to Revelation chapter 6. And uh, I'm very excited about this opportunity to share in this together. So I want us to just get into the text and see what God reveals. The theme this morning is the ultimate failure of evil. So I'm going to ask you to consider this with me. That the ultimate failure of anything is measured against what was stated or anticipated to be the ultimate victory. So there's no way to know if you've experienced failure at any measure unless you have something to measure it against. So you anticipated a victory of some kind. And when you didn't experience it, then you experienced a failure of some kind. But when we add the word ultimate, then we anticipated ultimate victory or what's the, the other side of it, ultimate failure. Now, depending on how we are so inclined this morning. We could either talk about failure versus victory, but I looked ahead at the next few lessons and I think they've got that covered. We could talk about just what it means to explore evil, but I think in doing so, we might actually miss the point of the chapters to which I've been assigned. If there is one word in the next sentence that I want you to underline, I will emphasize it. We are going to explore how to participate with God in the ultimate victory of Christ leading to the ultimate failure of evil. We're going to talk about how to participate in this ultimate victory of God that leads to the ultimate failure of evil. Now, I want to talk about evil for a few moments so that we can set some parameters as to what actually qualifies as evil. I don't know how many of you are watching the Dubuque, Iowa news, but Cashew, a favorite tortoise from the uh, local Museum of Science, uh, ended up missing. It was an awful situation. This was a few weeks ago. Turned Dubuque on its ear, made the evening news frontline stories for several nights. This 18-inch beautiful tortoise came up missing. An awful crime had been committed, and so they summoned the community. And so I went online, and I actually watched the evening news, the Dubuque evening news online. Now, it's kind of a slow feed, but I was able to watch it. And what starts happening is they bring out experts on the tortoise to try to help whoever is guilty understand that days, time, everything matters, and her diet is so critical, and the temperature bring cashew back. And then they brought in, this was awesome, they brought in a grandmother and a grandson down on her knee, staring into the empty terrarium where cashew was little boy crying the grandmother and she asked who would do such a thing i mean clearly inflicting unmitigated pain on a grandson oh there was tortoise tampering that was the headline tortoise tampering in dubuque <laughs> well here's what ended up happening they began quite the investigation one of the things they decided was that, you know, they were going to have to check into all possible security. And what's crazy is about the time that they were going to probably call in the FBI, Cashew reappeared on an elevator. <laughs> this is true. The elevator doors opened and there was Cashew on the elevator. Now, my crazy mind is thinking, you know, what does she do, just stare at those buttons up there for a while or wait till somebody, you know, kind of came up, pushed the button, and Cashew ran on? I don't know what a tortoise does. But they did find some video footage. Actually, I found some video footage of Cashew's escape. Could, 
Could we take a minute and roll the video uh, of Cashew's escape? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, anyway, you can kind of see the problem here. Cashew doesn't move very quickly. Well, here's what actually happened. After everybody had gone on the news, the grandmother, the experts, the, 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 the tortoise experts, it turns out nobody stole Cashew. Cashew wandered off and got herself stuck between a couple of walls, and she couldn't cry out. And she's trying to raise her hand, you know. <laughs> and finally, this, this uh, curator finds her, but realizes that now the museum will look like idiots if they come out and say, oh, by the way, she was stuck between a wall. So this, she, she, she actually put it on the elevator and hit the button, hopefully just to show up. So then they came back on the news, and this was awesome. Cashew was back. She's there being held by her curator, safe and sound at the museum. And here was the amazing line. Now that we know that Cashew was not stolen, we have a renewed sense of the goodness of humanity. <laughs> now I'm thinking you are living a pretty easy life. If somehow discovering that your tortoise is back safe and sound somehow is the dividing line between you determining whether you need to lock your doors at night. <laughs> you see, I think we've got other people that might look at this whole thing and wonder, do you folks know what evil looks like, smells like, hurts like? Maybe in Boston they might ask that question. Right? You see, I think some people would also ask that question in West Texas. Which brings up a concern for us because these are two very different situations. In fact, there were more fatalities in Texas than Boston. I remember years ago when the shuttle Challenger uh, uh, blew up in space as on the takeoff. That same day, there was a car accident in Arkansas, a multi-car accident, where the same number of people died there that died in the Challenger. But they didn't get a presidential eulogy. You see, part of the struggle we have is how we classify what it means to actually live under the oppression of evil. In fact, it can get so messed up. Listen to Steven Weinberg, Nobel laureate in physics. He made this comment, religion is an insult to human dignity. Without it, you would have good people doing good things and evil people doing evil things. But for good people to do evil things, now that takes religion. Now I'm suggesting, if I could have taken him and maybe introduced him to some people I know, he might begin to be forced by integrity to separate what he understands the role of religion to be in response to evil. I wonder if the Apostle John understood evil. I wonder if he knew the difference between hard times, suffering, consequence, and evil. As our brother David spoke, he mentioned that John had lived long enough to see the death of all the fellow apostles. And because you didn't have instantaneous news, I wondered what it was like for John to see his sister or brother in Christ come walking up into Ephesus or somewhere he was in Asia Minor and the greeting of a brother or sister from long ago. And then that moment, you know the moment, you know the moment, because you've seen it with people, where the face turns, the eyes water up. You say, John, I, you need to know that Thomas has died. Philip, Peter, Andrew. But see, John had a context for that. 
His context for that was in the streets of Jerusalem. We read about it in our Bibles in Acts chapter 12. It turns out that Herod, who knew a good bit about inflicting evil, that Herod singled out John's brother James. And with his evil machinations, he took him out in the street. I've never been able to think through this story without just feeling my heart want to beat out of my chest if I was John. Feeling helpless, probably held back by the brothers and the sisters that are saying, John, there's no way to stop it. There's nothing you can do about it. And then he watches Herod, who wouldn't know a good man if he spit him in the face, draw a sword and cut through his brother and watch his blood turn to mud in the dirt of the streets. John had a context for evil. John knew what it was like to walk as a witness in the face of impending evil. I'm guessing if the scholars are right, John had carried that burden maybe 50 years by the time the revelation came. So when the story of the faithful witness Antipas rolled across in the revelation that he died for the faith, I wonder if every single time John heard of another death of a witness, he thought back to that day in Jerusalem, even at least for a moment, of losing his brother in the face of of evil. So what is the ultimate victory of evil? You know, if we're going to study the ultimate failure, what's the ultimate victory? Now, we're going to read these passages together. What I've tried to do over the last several months is take these chapters, 6 through 11, and pull from them what will accurately reflect them. So we're going to read that together. We'll start in Revelation 6, 9 through 17. This is the opening of the fifth seal. There's been four, each one of them explaining this impending struggle, gigantic struggle. And start with me, though, in verse 9. When he, the angel, opened, or excuse me, when he, the lamb, opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, how long sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of of the earth and avenge their blood. Now, before we move on, this is almost a direct quote from 2 Ezra, a quote from that mid range apocalyptic literature where the primary question is asked almost identically there. But it, is, it has even deeper roots in Psalm 5 and 6. God, when there's injustice in the world, how long must we endure before you act in a way that makes sense to the victory we anticipate? This is not a new question for the people of God. But then each one of them was given a white robe and they were told to wait a little longer. Until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters were killed just as they had been. And I watched, and as he opened the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red. And the stars in the sky fell to the earth as figs dropped from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up. Every mountain and island was removed from its place. They called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us! Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For great, the great day of their wrath has come. And who can withstand it. Well, then we come into chapter 7, 
we get the message that God is going to withhold this violent cataclysmic response in such a way that his children will be secure. And then we come into chapter 9, or excuse me, chapter 7 and verse 9, and he says, after this, John says, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude. Now, I, like fate, have many things that I would like to say to Mike in private about the assignment of this text. <laughs> I went through the numbers just in this text and made three pages of just the numbers. Three of this and four of that and a bunch of sevens and one-thirds and one-quarters. Oh, I've got it all up here if you want it. But when it came to this one, there was no number. He just said, wow. I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, they were wearing white robes, there it is again, and holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength, seven of them, be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then an elder gave him a pop quiz. Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they and where would they come from? John trains all preachers with an outstanding answer. Sir, I answered, you know. <laughs> and he said, these are they that have come out of the great tribulation. Now, see, we like that. You know why? Because we like the word out. They've came out. Remember what Dave taught us last night? We're not just called out of something. We're called into something. You can't come out of a great tribulation if you haven't been in one. They've come out of a great tribulation. They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. I wonder what color they were before they touched the blood. Well, they weren't white. Because you can't make them white unless you touch the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God, and they serve Him day and night in His temple. He who sits on the throne will shelter them with His presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. Amen? My friend, Chia Quinya, Chi, wave up here. Chi and I were in Atlanta together, and we were at a local business. Remember that? Uh, doing, a, doing a talk. And somebody asked Chi, what is your favorite kind of food? And she said, it's something I don't have to kill first. Amen? It's a chicken you don't have to pluck, right? Notice that the promised chi to every woman and man and child you serve in Nigeria is when their lives have been dipped in the blood of the Lamb, they'll never hunger, they will never thirst. God has something for them they can't even imagine. Amen? Then the sun will not beat down with them, on them, nor any scorching heat, for the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. Isn't that a great turn of words? The lamb is the shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Wouldn't it just be awesome if he'd stop right there? But then it got real quiet in heaven for a little while. And he tells us about this seventh seal that's got seven trumpets, and we get to this third trumpet in verse 10. And a great star, blazing like a torch, fell from the sky on the third of the rivers, on the springs of water. Verse 11. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter, and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. And as I watched, I heard an eagle, eagle that was flying in midair call out in a voice, Whoa! Whoa! Woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blast about to be sounded by the other three angels. It's been bad and it's going to get worse. Chapter 9, the fifth angel sounded his trumpet and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the keys of the shaft of the abyss. And when, excuse me, 
And when he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like a smoke of a gigantic furnace. The sun and sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. And out of the smoke, locusts came down on the earth and were given power like that of the scorpions of the earth. Now they were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were not allowed to kill them, but everybody out loud together. Ready? Ready? You're going to read the Bible with me together. They were not allowed to kill them but only to torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of the scorpion when it strikes everybody. During those days, people will seek death but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. The poet Cornelius Gallus at the end of the first century B.C. wrote just like this and said perhaps the worst thing that could happen to a human would be to long to die and not be able to. He goes on and says, They had a king over them, the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek is Apollyon, that is, destroyer. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues still didn't repent of the work of their hands. They didn't stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, the idols that cannot see or not walk, and nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their their thefts so where are we how are we doing what's the message we're getting so far you say well i like that part about getting out of the great tribulation yeah well you notice that after he announced that they're the ones that came out of the great tribulation he said but let me bear in mind it isn't over you're still in it and more are going in you if you are following christ you're on a freeway where there are presently no exits from the great tribulation and as a witness of God, we've got to figure out what in the world the great tribulation has to do with kingdom advancement. Because, see, part of our struggle is we measure our lives in this country through comfort. We measure the victory through comfort. You'd have thought that the world came to an end in 2008 when we were hit hard in our pocketbooks as if somehow the worst had happened. I remember watching my dad when he was going in for uh, open heart surgery. He had to have two, uh, two bypasses and two artificial valves put in. We grew up in the sewer industry. My brother told the cardiologist if we'd have known it was valves, we'd have put them in. I asked my dad, I said, well, how are you feeling all about this? And he said, listen, if you'd have been born when I was born, I didn't know a lot of people over 60, 65. He said, I've passed 65. It's all gravy from here. I asked my dad one time, what's the hardest things you've ever faced? He said, losing our farm in the Depression and my mother killing herself in 1954. He came to Christ when I was going into middle school. He came to Christ powerfully, comprehensively, lovingly, affectionately. He came to Christ. And you know, it's interesting. I just don't hear him complain much about his finances, his health. I called him not too long ago, and I said, Dad, how's it going? He's in his 80s. He said, man, it's awesome. He said, I got my new Bible study team together. We're getting some of these men. They're coming closer to the Lord. He's in his 80s, and he's still putting together a team. You see, in his mind, in his mind, he's not thinking about this. I asked him about his budget. I asked him about his budget. He said, if I die broke, it looks like my budget was perfect. You see, our struggle is, is that we're reading this, but we're not believing it. The Great Tribulation is one of our New Testament doctrines. We are people who witness not just to tribulation, not just about tribulation. We worship and we witness from tribulation. Those who witness from affluence are on the verge of Deuteronomy 8 where we think we did it ourselves and God chose a mighty fine partner. 
God is not management and we are not union stewards. We are not coming to the table with grievances to bear to try to somehow even this thing out and get better benefits. We're living. Oh, we're living for him. Let's go ahead and let's move forward. Come down if you would. Uh, let's skip ahead to, to uh, chapter 11, okay? Skip ahead to chapter 11. Hey, aren't these guys in the back awesome? Could you just give, yeah, they're, they're amazing. I've enjoyed them so much. Okay, you ready for chapter 11? Okay, yep, you're right there. I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and here's what I was told. You go and measure the temple of God, its altar, and its worshipers. Exclude the outer court. Don't measure it because it's been given to the Gentiles. They're going to trample the holy city for 42 months. You can figure that one on your own. And I will appoint my two witnesses, and they'll prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth and ashes. And, of course, Mike will cover that. And there are two olive trees and two lampstands, and they stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone tries to harm them, well, fire comes out of their mouth and devours their enemy. This is how anyone wants to harm them must die. And we're thinking, now, now we're talking. That's right. We're talking commando Christian, man. We're talking Kevlar. We're loving it. No. They have the power to shut up the heavens so that it'll not rain during the time they're prophesying. There's Elijah. And they have power to turn waters to blood. There's an illusion to Moses. And to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. And now when they have finished their testimony, the beast is done. No. The beast comes up from the abyss. And attacks them, overpowers them, and kills them. Their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom in Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some people from every people, every tribe, every language, every nation. Haven't we heard that already? Wasn't that the great part in chapter 7? Every nation, every tribe, but no, look what they're doing. They're gazing on their bodies and refusing them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. How many of you feel like you're on a roller coaster in these chapters? Seriously. Highs, lows, mountaintops. And the abyss. Why do you think that the God who knows you better than you know yourself wrote revelation like this? It's because that is our experience. This is what the churches were going through. This is what people are going through. He wrote so that we could connect with him. But now look at verse 11. But after the three and a half days, is this not our Christian story? After three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and it struck terror into those who saw them. At that very hour, there was a severe earthquake, and a tenth of the city collapsed. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. The second woe was passed. The third woe was coming. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, everybody together, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who were seated on their thrones before God poof, fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, we give thanks to you. We give thanks to you. We give thanks to you. Well, for what? Oh, I, chapter 11. We're loving that. All of chapter 11? Well, no, probably just the last few verses. No, it's comprehensive. We give thanks to you. Lord God Almighty, the one who is and was and is to come, does that not stand firm for us? The God that they give thanks to is the God who was, the God who will be, and the God who is. The God who places us and coordinates us gives us our spiritual GPS signal in the midst of the great tribulation. It's the God that says, if you're in the great tribulation, you're not doomed to a life of futility. And we give you thanks because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry and your wrath has come. The time has come for judgment of the dead and for the rewarding of your servants, the prophets and your people who revere your name, both great and small, 
and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Now, let me ask you a question. Good or evil, who decides? Who decides what's good or evil? So do we say to the people in Texas, yours was a tragedy, but it was probably not evil. But the people in Boston, yours was a tragedy, but it was probably evil. And so what do we say to the parents expecting who either have had that second, third, fourth miscarriage, or they've had the child who has problems that they didn't anticipate knowing what to deal with? You know, what do we do with the young mother in Augusta, Georgia, Amelia Hiltz, who's hit head-on by a driver driving on the wrong side of the street, and it paralyzes her from the neck down so that even her doctor husband can't pull her out of it? What do we say to them? Now, is that good, bad, evil, up, down, suffering? Folks, we've spent too much time imagining that we can identify the evil in the world, and somehow that's what conquers it. Well, we've done a dynamite job identifying it, but we haven't done a very good job conquering it. All right. As fate said, there's one, word, one sentence for the sermon. Well, I'm going to give you two. And this is it. The ultimate victory of evil is the loss of imagination. The ultimate victory of evil is the loss of imagination. When we can no longer imagine something other than what is. When we can no longer imagine people beyond what we can see or experience. That is the ultimate victory of evil, and here is why. Because the loss of imagination scares us. It isolates us. It makes security our number one value. And isolation and security as the highest value are diametrically opposed to our mission. Isolation is diametrically opposed to our mission, and security is our highest value is diametrically opposed to our mission. When our children were small, one of the things I told them over and over and over again, my wife and I together, you were not born to make us happy. You were born to make God happy. You were born to bring about the glory of God. You go anywhere in this world. Don't think about where your mom and dad live. Don't try to figure out how to stay close to us and please us. You go in the world anywhere where God wants you. Do anything, anything God wants you to do. And then when our son... Well, got ready to go to college out at ACU. He knew he was called to be a missionary to Russian-speaking people. I knew that would narrow the pool of women that would be interested in this, this fine young man. But guess what he found? He found an awesome girl, didn't he? And so Aaron and Aaron moved to Russia. The day after they moved to Russia in 2010 to be missionaries a thousand miles east of Moscow, my wife and I were laying in bed and we were thinking about all those times we told them, oh, you didn't, you know, you weren't born to make us happy and all that stuff. She just looked at me and said, could you just shut up? <laughs> End it. And now that we got a grandbaby that's going to be born in September over in Russia. So now my wife is like, man, I sure hope you know the daily duties around here, you know, because you're going to be on your own. <laughs> See, what are we really living for? What do you think you're actually living for? What are our churches actually existing for? We're not existing to kind of build these little fortresses where we kind of pull up the drawbridge and make sure we're all safe and secure and everybody's nodding their heads at the right time, put down the drawbridge, run out into the world, grab some unsuspecting unbeliever or at least a believer that's in a different tribe and yank them in, get their testimony gussied up and going, you know. This is not why we live. Can you imagine going to the Lamb, to the witness, and saying, oh my goodness, 
We gave everything we had to play in it safe. And he says, for who? Where did you get that I would want that? I'm 52. So I'm somewhere midway here. If you're over 52 and your biggest concern is comfort, you have missed the gospel message. If I were you, and I'm on my way to being you, <laughs> there is no way on God's green earth that I would think my highest calling is to figure out how to keep it comfortable until I slip to the other side. Go out with a bang. Turn up the heat. Become known in your churches as people who are risky and lay it on the line. Create some legends in your churches. We've got legends in our churches. In our church at home, we've got people in their 70s, 80s, and 90s that are mentoring our cocaine addicts and our alcoholics and our former prostitutes. We got women that wouldn't know cocaine if it was labeled on a plate, helping people come out of prostitution and out of cocaine abuse. Lay down some legends, brothers and sisters. If you're a retirement age, do something awesome with it. Do something awesome with it. You know, you know we're in love with you. My goodness, when we first started ministry 29 years ago, I got involved with the senior citizen ministry up in Ohio, and I've been addicted to it ever since. But they're the people, you're the people that, man, you know what to do with this thing. You realize that the oldest guy in the D-Day invasion, 57 years old, Teddy Roosevelt Jr. Crazy thing. They, you know, all the waves, they ended up missing the mark on the beach. They had it all mapped up, but they ended up about 500 yards down the beach. So they're on the wrong beach. This is the oldest dude out there. He stood up, took off his helmet because he didn't like him anyway, and he started marching up and down in front of his men, and he said, we have, may have landed in the wrong place, but we will start the war from here. <laughs> this is your calling. Don't ever let a young person have to try to figure out how to do somebody, outdo somebody that's been in the faith forever. If you know the faith, live the faith. You got tribulations. I know you got tribulations. You got everything from your bunions all the way to the top of your head giving you problems. People need to see you living powerfully. You know it. Let's live it for this next generation. They will love following you. They'll love it. Our kids love it. Our kids have got heroes. Our kids have had to go through the deaths and the burials of the heroes. But when you go to the funeral of someone who laid it all on the line for the kingdom, our kids have a model of how to live. Two elders that were in Indiana where I preached for nine years, these two guys in their 30s made a decision that they would give as much in their retirement years as they gave in their peak earning years. And that's why they stayed in the same homes for 50 years. That's why they drove cars that they did. That's why they made decisions about how they would spend their lives financially. Those men did it. Those men led it. Those men left a footprint and an impact, not just in that state, but in these kids and these young people that are going all around the world. When we did their funerals, there were people all around telling stories, Gene and Jeannie stories about the power that they saw of God living in these people. Many of them didn't even meet him until they were in retirement. If the ultimate victory of evil is the loss of imagination, what would be, what would be the ultimate failure of evil? It would be for us to regain our imagination. To once again believe that he who began a good work in us is faithful and he will bring it to completion. John Paul Lederach, a world famous negotiator of peace in some of the most 
awful conflicts around the world, wrote a book called The Moral Imagination, then this is what he says. The moral imagination is the capacity to imagine something rooted in the challenges of the real world, yet capable of giving birth to that which does not yet exist. Amen. So now I want to give us some thoughts to think about as we march forward. Let's do this first. I want to challenge you in how you imagine the people around you. I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you in your imagination about culture, race, religion, and nationality. I want to challenge you to do that. I want to challenge you in what you say, what you email, what you talk about, that you from this day forward refuse the categories of the world. Brothers and sisters, anybody who is not in Christ is someone we want to meet, someone we want to be among. You go among the people that you think are your enemies, and they may end up being your enemies, or they may end up being your brother or sister in Christ. But go among them. Letter Rock tells us, imagine a world in which your enemies are in your circle. How else are you going to lead them to Christ? What do we see at Golgotha? We see Jesus on the cross. Who else do we see? We see his mother Mary. Who else do we see? A few friends and his apostle John. But who else do we see? Soldiers, criminals, enemy. And what do we see moving forward? Faith in the soldier. Faith in the criminal on the cross. Priests coming to Christ. Pharisees coming to Christ. Jesus planted himself in the midst of his enemies and let them decide what to do about it. You look around at the people and the color they're wrapped in and say, no more racial profiling or categorizing. No more of this business. How many of you believe in Genesis? Come on, you believe in Genesis? Shake your head, yes, no, or baby, it'll go faster. Well, then out of one man, God made every nation. What color was he? What, do you think he was yours? Why do you think God kept it a secret? Because he wants you to see his image in everybody. And this includes gender. It also includes the choices people are making with their lives. I am never stunned anymore by what I hear on the news. But I am often surprised at my own short-sightedness and maybe the short-sightedness of our brothers and sisters in Christ. I would advise you and beg you that you will never again talk negatively about someone that you're not talking lovingly to. If you're not talking lovingly to the people in your life that are making sexual decisions different than yours, quit talking negatively about them. How in the world do you think the Christian witness will push forward if you're talking negatively about someone that you're not even talking lovingly to? How's that going to happen? It won't. So I'm challenging you to engage with your imagination. Well, I'm going to close with a sister at home. This is Lisa Barnes. Oh, Lisa Barnes. One of my heroes. Lisa was born in 1966. College grad, singer, beauty consultant. When I met her, she was vibrant, not a touch of illness, nothing even close. But then came the kidney failure, the pancreas failure, round one of cancer, Round two of cancer, C. diff infection, stroke, paralysis, cancer. That's where she is now. On this day, with some of our brothers and sisters of Christ, her mom, the lady back to the left of the wheelchair there is Donna Barnes, no relation. Donna was coming over as a home health care nurse. Lisa engaged her in the good news of Christ. 
But he said, kept trying to probe and find out, Donna, what is it that's sapping the energy out of your life? Now, bear in mind that Lisa is actively right now fighting cancer. She's completely paralyzed on the left side of her body, completely. And she wants to know, what's, what's taking your energy? Do you know where you could find life? You could find life in Jesus Christ. That's where I find my joy. Donna was overwhelmed. Lisa called me one day. She said, hey, you going to be at the church today? Of course, you bet. She said, come on, we got to meet at the water. We got a lady who wants to give her life to Christ. We went down there and shared in the testimony. We baptized Donna, came back, sat around the wheelchair, and here's what Lisa said. She said, I was down for a while, but I feel like I'm finally back to my old self. What old self, sister? Because I've known her long enough to know the old self that walked and sang and consulted and that has no interest in her at all before her cancer surgery I stood by the hospital door for two or three minutes watching her minister to a phlebotomist in there taking her blood and so I just stood in the room the phlebotomist goes over she hugs her and kisses her thank you thank you tears going down her face nurse comes in tells me she's amazing she changes the whole wing when she's up here and kisses her and hugs her. Her doctor comes in. And you know, some doctors are a little stoic. But not around Lisa. They can't stand it. She's too magnetic. Because you see, in the midst of the great tribulation, her imagination is alive. And she can see God working through her, imag through her imagination. She can see God working through her suffering. And she imagines that just maybe I might be more effective like this than any other way. And so the ultimate failure of evil is the believer who imagines life in the midst of the promises that Christ came to deliver. God bless you.